couple of rental properties and been told by the broker, you're absolutely stuck and can't borrow anymore. That is exactly the situation of our latest Unstuck Yourself winner, Jack Noble. Hey Todd, Jack here, currently stuck at investment property number three, looking forward to getting the help from yourself and the three professionals you've selected to get me unstuck. Thanks mate. Jack and his wife Taylor are a young family from Adelaide that have already done an amazing job to get to three rentals, but feel it's time to get in front of our expert panel to get them unstuck, moving towards purchases four and hopefully five. Get the finance, that's the first hurdle. Jack really wanted to achieve about 150K passive. To kick things off, Morgan Bushel, property investor and mortgage broker, founder of Full Circle Finance, has got the runs on the board in both directions, from both an investing and finance perspective to hopefully get these guys moving forward. When it comes to buying property, I advocate using equity over cash. You then actually jump to so an extra hundred thousand dollars to play with. Next up, we're talking to property investor and accountant Jeremy Unizelli. With a whopping twenty million dollar plus personal portfolio, Jeremy knows a thing or two about the fine details when it comes to property investing. If it's a property that has a very strong path to being positive, they're really good and ideal for trust structures. There's always a twenty percent improvement staring us in the face. And finally, to bring it all together, Simon Liu, property investor and founder of House Finders, having bought literally thousands of properties and a personal portfolio portfolio worth over $30 million. Simon lends his expertise, talking us through the what and the where to help Jack and Taylor get unstuck. Sell based on three reasons. If you've already doubled in value in six years, you should sell it. The second reason is if it becomes an opportunity cost. Another reason you should sell is if the house is holding you back from buying more properties. You've got a pretty solid strategy there across all three of us to move forward. One thing I've learned is just to don't stop. It's been a while since we've made one of these and it's been awesome hanging out with Jack and Taylor and watching how the new positive path is starting to unfold for them. If you think you're stuck and want to be flown to Adelaide to sit down to have pizza with me and be in front of an expert panel to help get you unstuck, click the link in the show notes below and tell us a little bit more about why you're stuck. But right now, let's jump into the episode with Jack Noble so we can talk with Morgan Bushel, Jeremy Unizelli and Simon Liu. Jack Noble. How you going, man? Going well, mate. Yourself? Yeah, good. So uh, you're a bit stuck, I hear. Yeah, a little bit stuck. Currently at uh, investment property number three, looking for the fourth. Building a property in Perth at the moment. Not too sure when it's going to be finished. Broker basically said we're stuck and we can't get anything until that property's producing an income. And my wife Taylor goes back to work or gets a return to work letter. Right. So And, and she's off work at the moment, what, mat leave? or Yeah, off work on mat, mat leave. Okay. Um, probably going back in... April, May at the moment. All right. So you guys are down to one income. You're building in Perth and brokers basically said, no go. It's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much until that thing's producing rent. And at least we get that letter. He, uh, they basically said, yeah, you, you can't, you can't do anything. All right. And what's the goal? Well, if we get to the end of this episode, how do we know that you're actually properly unstuck? You need to be able to get the finance. Okay. That's a, that's the first uh, hurdle. And then after that, it's um, knowing sort of what, what, asset to select so what type of what type of property where uh what sort of yield we're looking for how negative can it be because are you pretty negatively geared at the moment yeah quite heavily negatively geared how heavy is um, heavy so with the the glenelg and the huntfield heights properties they're mm -hmm. combined about twenty thousand a year negative at the moment okay so when you say three properties what, one ppr and two rentals uh so just the two the two uh excluding the ppor excluding the P okay so there's one ppor Two rentals and one rental currently being built that isn't technically a rental yet because it's yeah. not rented out yet. Yeah, that's it. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So you're looking at this through the lens of getting unstuck is getting the finance, but that's really the first hurdle because getting the finance to then getting into another property that also gets you stuck isn't really getting you unstuck. Mm -hmm. That's only just like sort of exchanging one issue for another issue. So it's getting the finance and then getting into an asset that can allow you to go again. Well, mate, we've got a good team in front of you then. Now you've already spoken to all of these guys a little bit off air, but we're gonna be going into a lot more of the detail as to what your situation is, what are the problems in the way, and then really how to solve them to get you exactly to that point of being able to potentially purchase again and being able to purchase an asset that hopefully moves you forward again and again and again. But is there anything else that you wanted to sort of add to this before we jump into the first call with, um, I believe it's Morgan we're chatting with first? Yeah, I mean, just off the top of my head, I think it's got to have decent cash flow mm -hmm. with uh, our current position. Got to start geared. outweighing that, yep. I think obviously we don't invest for cash flow. Like capital growth is really going to accelerate the portfolio. But yeah, we do need to keep one eye on, on cash flow for sure. Gotcha. Don't get too negative. 
Okay. So that means when we're chatting with Simon at the end, we're going to be pressing down a lot more on like how do we improve that yield? How do we make sure we're going after a good yield, but not at the expense of yeah. good capital growth? That's it. Yeah. We definitely don't want to sacrifice the capital growth. All right, man. Well, why don't we start with Morgan and uh, jump into the call with him? Sounds good. Let's do it. Morgan Bushel, property investor and mortgage broker, founder of Full Circle Finance. Morgan Bushel, how are you, man? Good, thanks, Todd. How are you? Mate, very good. Good to have you on the team again. I'm looking forward to seeing that what you've got in store for Jack and how you're going to unpack his situation to help get this man unstuck and continue investing because he's already built something that's pretty good, but he wants to keep going. Before we get into undoing the blockage, can we actually talk a little bit more about the issue from a financial point of view of what you can really see that I guess has got Jack stuck? Yeah. So with Jack, like he's done an exceptional job of growing the portfolio so far and um it's kind of reached a point for him where like there's there's equity on the table that we can use to help him grow but the challenge more than anything is probably borrowing capacity at this stage in his journey okay so the deposits there but the serviceability is a little bit restricted correct yeah gotcha okay and is that more so income wise uh, that you're seeing or like rental yield or a combination of both or it's a little bit of both um but I think if we were to kind of look at one in particular thing, it could be more the income side of it, but then one property in particular is having a bit of an impact on that as well as some of the smaller commitments as well. Going into that property, Jack, did you know that? Like, did you kind of buy one property going, okay, I think this is going to like maybe hit us a bit yield wise, but it was a growth play or was that just a bit of a, we didn't know at the time? Yeah, I didn't really know at the time. So is it mainly just that one property that's kind of got the more stuck or is it more of the, the income side? Like what, what really is it? Probably a combination of both. Like the income is one aspect, but then yeah, the property itself, like there's the income side of it's not super strong and it just has a, a kind of a negative flow on effect to the rest of um, the plans there. So yeah, it's kind of a combo of both really. So that's the one that you kind of, you bought and it's like, all right, this is a good idea, but then not too long after it started construction, you're like, maybe this wasn't the best idea. Is that right? Pretty much. Yeah. The construction is taking a lot longer than we thought having to wear sort of the loan costs along the way that not being tax deductible as well. That I only found out not long ago. <laughs> yeah, um, that would have been of an unpleasant surprise. Yeah, in hindsight, we should have just got something pre-established, I think, and had the rent coming in from day one. So is, is that why it's hurting then, Morgan? Is it because there's no rent coming in at the moment? Or is it hurting because you've modelled it out and like even when the rent does come in, it's too low a yielding? We still can with banks use like valuation-based uh, rent or even appraisals to kind of help Jack and Taylor keep moving. In reality to Jack probably right now, yeah, like cash flow-wise, it's probably not like that great lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, we can, like I kind of mentioned, we can still keep the things moving, but if we had to pinpoint it to one particular property that's holding him back on his journey, this would be the one. Okay, so yeah. it sounds like there's gonna be some potential around looking into selling this property maybe? Yeah, like we kind of played around whether we keep it, what's the flow and effect from that versus selling it, what's the flow and effect from that as well. Out of interest, how does that make you feel thinking about getting rid of it? Pretty happy to get rid of it. It was probably, a bit of a rush decision. We probably didn't do our due diligence like we should have. Small land size, two bed, one bath, probably should have got at least three. How big's the land? 209 square meters. Yeah, right. So it's like not quite a unit, but not mm. quite a house. It's, yeah, like, it's like a tiny two bedroom house. Yeah. So getting rid of it isn't like a big, oh, I don't want to get rid of it, but no. I know I have to. Like you actually sound like you're pretty happy to get rid of it. Yeah. At the moment, if that's what we have to do to keep moving forward, then ha yeah, happy to do it. Okay. We, if, if we can get a better asset, then yeah. So can we take a look at what this actually looks like as far as scenario wise from a lending perspective? Because you've done a couple different scenarios depending on what Jack and Taylor do, haven't you? Yes, we have. Okay, awesome. What are they looking like? I think the first thing we kind of looked at is like not touching or changing absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. And look, we can move forward. It's just not going to be the most ideal situation. Like the kind of banks will be looking as the next investment property would most likely be third tier lenders, which doesn't really kind of fit the mold when we have other things to potentially play with. What um, kind of interest rates just out of interest are we looking at? Cause a third tier lender, I'm not, they're not doing it cause they're nice guys, are they? They're, they're, they're making a quick. No, no, we're, we're looking like mid to high 8%. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I can see why yeah. the, you were looking at other options before you went down that avenue. If like they were willing to change things, which, you know, we later obviously found out that was the case, then yeah, we can work with banks that will ultimately help them grow a lot quicker 
and also better cash flow wise too. And and what did that leave you with? Yeah, so we kind of I guess we opened things up by looking at, you know, if we change this, here's a flow on effect, or what are you willing to kind of change to improve your situation? So we looked at, for example, Jack's uh, like car loan. So there's actually two of them. And then we kind of played around with either also like removing Golden Bay. So we kind of took it in a layered approach where we went with the one that's the easiest to remove and then worked all the way towards then potentially selling Golden Bay and then the flow on effect to the portfolio after that. And when you say easiest, you're talking easiest from a like lifestyle point of view, cash flow point of view, like what, what, Where's easy come into it? I'm talking from a lens in like lending wise. And I mean, when you're looking at kind of repay or like debts to repay, you typically want to pick the one that's going to part ways with the least amount of cash, either cash on hand or using equity. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of how we started with it. Okay. And so what did that leave uh, Jack and um, Taylor's situation looking like if you were to start getting rid of things? It was obviously a bit of a dialogue between both of us, whether they were actually willing to change things. But once it became very clear, we were okay doing this and exploring with the flow on effect. We first looked at a car loan that had a limit remaining of about $10,000. We first played around with removing that. And once that was out of the picture, we were then able to kind of almost just get that next investment property with the first tier bank. Right, just from removing 10K car loan. We think the 10K one we're going to get rid of, like no questions asked. Yeah. And then the second one, which is around that 32,000K mark, if we can sell that as well and get into a better property with a higher borrowing power, yep. then we'll consider it. But if we can just do one for now, then... We're happy with that. What what would that look like then, Morgan? So if they were to get rid of the the 10K car loan and that puts them down from going into banks that are like eight, eight and a half percent to to more like what, six and a half percent interest rates, but same kind of borrowing power or is the borrowing power shift as well? No, so like borrowing power, like it's more or less the same. We're just getting better rates, which will then help them with their cash flow. Gotcha. And what kind of borrowing power does that put them into if they get rid of that 10K car loan? Yeah, so this is on the assumption that we extract a bit of equity first yep. to act as the deposit for the next property. Okay. We're, so the next purchase property, we're kind of, we've modeled off up to a 700K investment property using an 80% LVR on the loan, five years interest only, and roughly kind of modeling off a 4.5% rental yield on that new property. All right, 700K. Um it's not sounding like you're very stuck, mate. Remind me why you're here again. Yeah, so about three or four months ago, we uh, spoke with a broker. They basically said we're capped out at the moment yeah. due to the Golden Bay property being still under construction, not producing any rent, and we'd also require a return to work letter um, for Taylor, who's currently on maternity leave. Right, so you've already been through this in a way where they've basically said that not only like – you can't get a little bit, but they're like, you're done. You can't yeah, get anything. Yeah, he much. said pretty much you can't do anything. Okay. So can you explain a little bit of the magic wand move that you've like expelliarmist and, and made? I don't know if I should use Harry Potter references, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> what have you done here, Morgan? How are you going from zero to 700K, mate? Initially, when we got all the details from Jack and Taylor, um, I think the first thing that like, oh, I don't want to bash brokers because yeah, it's just not something I'm keen on doing, but like, when I looked at the financials of the business, for example, like the latest year's financials, like they, they weren't as strong as a prior one. And I thought, okay, like here's, here's a bit of a challenge. How can we overcome it? And when it came to looking at bank policies, I realized that we could still actually use the prior year's financials because we have about a five month gap before banks can no longer accept those. That was the first thing I kind of realized by them being able to use the prior year's income, Um, depending on which lender we went to, because Golden Bay is still under construction, some lenders are okay with using rental appraisals on the basis that the property is going to be completed within a reasonable time frame. So that kind of solved that rental income piece. Otherwise, yeah, we'd probably have to produce a full valuation to show the end rent on that property as well. Interesting. Okay. So the two sort of keys, and I'm assuming there's probably a bit more to this puzzle as well, but the two big ones that come to mind is that using last year's financials because they were much stronger and also 
using a lender that will actually accept a rental letter, whereas the other ones probably just didn't even look at it. And they were like, well, there's no rent, so there's no income. So that's now a liability. So 700K, and that's just getting rid of the 10K car loan. So Taylor and I have pretty much decided we're definitely going to get rid of the $10,000 one. What's it going to look like if we also get rid of the car loan that's approximately 32000 as well? It does move the needle quite a lot. Like we would probably be able to release a little bit more equity from one of your properties to not only fund the deposit of that $700,000 one, but then you'd have a little bit more um, like equity around that you could either have for a rainy day or potentially put towards a deposit on that next investment property. And so dollar wise, what are we talking? Like an extra 50 grand, 100 grand? So we actually originally started with extracting 160 in equity to yep. fund the purchase of the 700K property, but we then actually jumped to 260. So an extra $100,000 to play with. Yeah, right. Okay. Because the way I always look at this, and like Jack and I were having a bit of a chat about this off air just beforehand is if you're paying off something for, for 30 grand and that it increases your borrowing power, but now you're 30 grand short on your deposit and you can't pull it together, it's like, well, it's a false economy, there's no point. But you're saying mm. essentially you're paying off this 30 grand and then you can essentially unlock another $100,000 in equity for your deposit. So to me, as long as lifestyle-wise that fits for you, that sounds like a bit of a no-brainer, really. With this particular step, uh, if the second car loan is gone, they're like, we'll definitely be able to get into the next investment property. If they did want to go again, that's probably where we would be looking at non, like non first tier lenders. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when we kind of played around with, oh, okay, what happens if we remove Golden Bay? What does that look like then? And does that look like a million times better or just a little bit better if they were to actually sell down Golden Bay? We kind of played around with a very conservative approach of, okay, if you sold and just broke even on that, We've still got 260 to play with. We could essentially go and buy two investment properties off the back of that. So that means their 700K turns into? We'd be looking somewhere between like 550 to 600 for that next property after that. And But then they could go twice, potentially. Yeah, like they more or less wouldn't have to touch as much of their cash reserves that they already have. would just be funding like the next property and the one after with equity. What kind of yield do they need to keep this in? Because right now I'm thinking of questions to ask for, for Simon, but also questions to ask for Jeremy up next when it comes to like trust side of things as well. But for the yield, if they're going to potentially go again twice, I'm assuming, because we were talking about Melbourne before, is Melbourne going to be maybe a bit of a tricky one because it's such a lower yield? Or is it like, no, we can still do this with a 4% yield? Yeah, I mean, we we're playing between like four and a half 5% rental yield. Yep. I think if we were to go a little bit lower in the yield, look, we could still squeeze one more in quite comfortably. It would just then come down to what is that flow effect onto that next one. And I guess just daily life for your cash flow wise being more negative as well. Yeah, already quite heavily negatively geared. So, yep. you know, the next one doesn't have to be positive, which is pretty hard to get these days anyway. So as far as questions that Jack needs to be asking Jeremy next up from the accounting perspective, and obviously being a business owner, he's looking into to a corporate trustee structure, different kinds of options. What do you advise that, that he should be asking? Maybe these car loans that we're looking at paying off, there could be some flow on effects from a GST perspective. So like it's all good and well to pay these off to help them with the goal. But one thing I'm kind of mindful of on their behalf is like you won't be able to claim that GST going forward for the remainder of that loan as far as I'm aware. So that's one thing, depending on how they're planning to buy as well, um, whether it's in personal name or trusts, then that's something that, yeah, they just have to be mindful of as well. So if it's personal name and trust out of interest borrowing wise, does that change things completely or just a little bit? If Jeremy was to say, actually, yeah, now it's time to move to a corporate trustee structure. Yeah. For the first one and or whoever we do pick for that next property, if it is under a trust, it would slightly decrease their borrowing capacity as opposed to buying in their personal name. And is that mainly because you can't claim the negative gearing benefits or are there other reasons behind that too? That's more or less it. So it's most banks view it in that same sort of guise and it just makes that first one a little bit hard to get. But then, yeah, that's when you can kind of use that and the trust kind of 
uh, structures to then later preserve borrowing capacity later. All right. So big things that you've changed is making sure that you're using a stronger year's financials for the business instead of the the present one, which the other broker sounds like that's what they were probably looking at at face yeah. value. Also making sure that you're looking at lenders that would accept a rental letter for Golden Bay if you do end up keeping it. But then if you end up selling it, it looks like that really opens up your, your options down the track. Is there anything else that we should have asked Morgan that we haven't or anything else, Jack, you've got question wise before we move on, mate? Um, probably just around like using cash versus equity or both and what's going to be our best option there. We just need to keep like a little probably, you know, the three months emergency fund. Absolutely. $5,000 per property. Say after that, like we don't really value holding the cash. So we'd be happy to to put that down as a deposit for the next one. Generally speaking, when it comes to buying property, I always advocate using equity over cash because saving up your cash balance, it just takes way longer than property values will ever increase. Mm. So hold on to it as long as you can. We'd, it's better to use the bank's money to help fund and fuel your growth. But heck, if you're like willing to like use some of that cash reserves and you don't have any reservations about it, then yeah, absolutely put it towards that next property. It can help you, um, yeah, just get into that next one way quicker. Yeah, and what about from a cash flow perspective, like using less cash where, you know, technically we're lending more, so mm. it's sort of affecting the cash flow. Good question. Does that then hurt my borrowing power for the next one? Technically it does because we're kind of leveraging more as opposed to using like a bit of cash. But in the scheme of things, like, it's what we've modeled off is not really using any cash at all, except for the one after the next, where I think we kind of figured we need to maybe use a little bit of cash. Um, the benefit of this cash too, is it can actually then like offset some of your um, loans as well. So you could either park that in your, your home loan or some of the investment loans to kind of help with cash flow a little bit more too. So pretty much as long as we can afford to hold that extra bit of debt, it's not affecting our lifestyle too much, then it's not an issue, really. Would you say to explore like a debt recycling option? Definitely something worth considering too. And I think, you know, if that's something that works out for them tax-wise, then yeah, absolutely, because that would then convert some of the non-deductible debt into deductible debt, which then in turn like help, helps borrowing capacity a little bit more too. Well, I feel like we can open up debt recycling, but that's a whole other episode for, for another time. But Morgan Bushel from Full Circle Finance, thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. Um, I think it's time for us to jump into the chat with Jeremy now. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Cheers, Morgan. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. I don't want to badmouth other brokers. But um, it sounds like maybe you didn't get the best advice not long ago. Well, they definitely didn't look at my 2023 20, financials, which were obviously a lot stronger. And yeah, by Morgan, just having a look at that, that's just unlocked quite a, quite a lot of borrowing power there. For me, the biggest takeaway with this is like, for all we know, that broker is amazing, but they didn't ask you the right questions. Yeah. Whereas Morgan sat down with you and went, okay, yeah, your situation is a bit tricky, but here's a whole bunch of questions to, to actually fix this. Like you spent a bit of time with him behind the scenes, yeah? Yeah, yeah, we did. Okay, so if yeah, if you're listening to this right now and you're like, yeah, that sounds like my situation, whilst not everyone's situation can be unlocked exactly the same way Jack's is, it just goes to show the power in making sure you're working with someone that is solution-focused, but that's also curious, that can go, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? Instead of just looking at face value of, sorry, you can't do anything and moving on. Because now this is now the difference between you potentially buying another one or two properties to invest with versus nothing. Yeah, unbelievable. Ma massive difference just from, yeah, a small change. Mate, I feel like you're already unstuck now, but um, we've still got a few more people to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now it's not just about getting you unstuck from the financing side, which that you're out of the quicksand, but it's about making sure you don't step into another load of quicksand and this is where we're going to start talking entities with Jeremy. We're going to start talking taxation around your business and basically just also a little bit about flipping because you've shown a bit of an interest on potentially leaning on your connections in the industry and also your own trade skills. But is there anything you wanted to sort of set the scene with with this one before we start talking to Jeremy? No, that's that's everything. Pretty much ready to go. Done, man. Well, why don't we jump straight into the call with Jeremy? Let's do it. 
We're talking to property investor and accountant Jeremy Unizelli with a whopping $20 million plus personal portfolio. Jeremy Unizelli, how are you, man? Very well, mate. Looking forward back again for another Unstuck Yourself series. And um, yes, yeah, this is, uh, I think, one uh, in Jack's situation where it's it's not unique. There are many people uh, in similar situations, especially, you know, running small businesses and wanting to get the best level of, of outcome um, and achieving the best results. And that's just finding the right people to give you some alternative solutions. So really looking forward to unpacking a lot of Jack's situation and looking forward to kind of getting him on the right steps so we can start to open some new doors with some new journeys ahead of you, Jack. And it's been exciting to have some chats with you in the background and very exciting what you've, what you've been able to achieve so far and, and really looking forward to seeing your next leg of the journey as well. well and that's it. He's not starting from zero. Jack and Taylor have already got a, a pretty solid base under them right now. So to be able to keep moving forward, that's really the name of the game with this and where where, where, where they're a bit stuck. Now, we've already had a chat with Morgan about this. We've basically changed it from you can't do anything with the conversation you had with the original broker to like we can get you into another one, possibly two properties. There's a few variations, though, that Morgan's basically talked about, and one of them had to do with GST implications. But did you actually want to field that that question, Jack, for Jeremy? Yeah, so we're looking at um, definitely selling one of the company vehicles. Uh, sorry, paying off one of the company vehicle loans. What are the GST implications of actually selling one or, mm -hmm. or both? Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of people actually don't understand uh, what happens or the implications when you do sell a company asset or or a vehicle for argument's sake. But the, the good thing is, is if you were to pay down those debts, there's no GST implications because it's just a reduction of the liability. But if you were to sell those vehicles, Jack, you would have claimed GST most likely on the way in if you've purchased them through a registered dealer or even someone off the street who's registered for GST. So you would have been able to claim back 111th based on the business use of the vehicle. When you do sell that uh, that vehicle, say to someone off the street or to a dealer or trade it in, you will have to pay GST at one eleventh of the sale price. So for argument's sake, you may have bought the vehicle for 55 grand, including GST, you would have got back, you know, about 5,000 give or take. When selling that vehicle for say 33 grand, $3,000 is included in the GST portion of the sale amount. So therefore you will have to pay in your business activity statement that you lodge either monthly, quarterly or annually, you'll need to pay that $3,000 back to the ATO. What a little known thing is, and it's something that you do need to be aware of, is if you have depreciated those vehicles down, let's say for argument's sake, all the way down to zero. So on your balance sheet, they're worth zero and you've claimed say 50 grand worth of depreciation throughout the duration of ownership. When you sell that vehicle for 33 grand, three grand will go to the tax office as GST. So they'll have a good clip. And the other $30,000 needs to be added to your profit and loss statement, Jack, is what they call a gain on sale. So your company will actually pay tax at most likely 25% on that $30,000 gain that you've made. Because remember, you've depreciated your vehicle down to zero. You've now sold it for 30, essentially saying that, well, it was worth nothing on my books. I've got the benefit of the cost. Now I'm selling it for 30. You've got to preempt that there'll be some tax that you need to pay on now the gain that you've made on the sale of that vehicle. So very important you take that into consideration that that 30 grand you may get in on hypothetical sale numbers, not all of it's yours. Um, about 25% of that will go to the tax office as a profit. I'm just squiggling quick numbers here, Jez. So if, if he sells it for 30 and then has to pay back 10% GST, so we're down to 27, then has to pay 25% profit. Are we down to like basically 19, 20 grand staying in Jack's pocket? That would be correct, yeah. On the basis if you sold it for 30 grand, including GST, my numbers were 33 grand, including GST. Okay. So let's just use 30 grand now as what they call the net sale price after GST. Then yeah, 25% of that, seven and a half thousand would go to the tax office, leaving leaving Jack's company uh, with a balance of around about 22 and a half grand after the 30 grand sale has occurred. Okay, um, so There's this still, still a bit of bit a bit of coin there, definitely yeah. from a, a capital perspective. Jack, your business now does have about 20ish grand plus more than what it did with the sale of that asset, but. My, um, my biggest words of wisdom or advice would be in this situation is sell a vehicle if you have no need for it. It's like a tool. Mm -hmm. um, if there is no need for that vehicle and it's kind of sitting there collecting dust and not producing you an income and it's providing an inefficiency to your business because there's wear and tear, repairs and reg on insurance and all things alike, then like any business, if it's not being used, move it on. 
Um, but if it's a if it's a pivotal part of your business itself and you're using it every day and you're just selling it to go maybe buy another one, uh, that's something you do need to take in consideration that, you know, when you buy another vehicle, unfortunately, as we all know, when you drive it off the lot in most cases now post COVID, mm. uh, it's definitely worth a lot less than what you paid for it brand new. So it's not like this uh, makes a huge difference to lending wise uh, for like the GST implications, but it's more so just being aware that if you sell it for 33, you don't, you don't have $33,000. Mm. Yeah. That, that's yeah. Yeah. That's okay. right. Three grand to the tax office, another seven and a half to the tax office in the form of tax. Well, I suppose pretty unlikely to actually sell them. They're required for the business. It's more uh, of the pay down. Yeah. It's the pay down. So obviously quite a bit of debt attached to them. We're definitely going to pay down the smaller one first. And then the second one we're sort of thinking about. So that's we're 50, 50 on that one. So typically one of the things I see uh, Jack and Todd is, you know, you might have a client with five or six or seven grand left um, on a loan for the car. Mm -hmm. Now I don't want to dive too much into Morgan's side of things, but nevertheless, uh, what I advise clients is if you've got five or six grand owing left on the car, but it's choking up say 800, 900, a thousand dollars worth of month of repayments then the borrowing implications on having a five grand debt that's choking up 900 to a thousand dollars worth a month of repayments is mm. huge. Yeah. And that, that, and I, the theme I wanted to kind of keep for today, especially with Jack is all about low hanging fruits. Cause I feel sometimes a lot of people advise about major changes that we need to do to, you know, to affect major positive changes in our potentially lending or purchasing or investment journey, but we really forget about the low hanging fruits that are right there in front of us. The things at the very bottom of the tree, the easiest stuff to get, but as humans, we're always looking to the very top because we mm. think that's sometimes where the juicier fruits are forgetting that some of the easiest stuff and most tasteful stuff is right there in front of us. Very easy to pick. All right. Well, with that in mind, what are we kicking it off with then Jez? What's the first uh, low hanging fruit that should be plucked from the tree for helping Jack's situation? Well, a couple things. So just setting the scene again. So Jack's obviously got the property in Golden Bay in WA, which was an off the plan build. Mm -hmm. um, he's got his unit in Glenelg that Jack by memory purchased around late 2017, 18. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, May 2018. May 2018. And a minor renovation has, uh, well, minor or, or maybe medium style renovations gone on to that unit. And, you know, for anyone who's invested in the Adelaide market, it, it remained quite flat for a number of years. And Jack's seen a significant amount of growth in that property during that COVID pandemic boom, where Adelaide and South Australia as a state and Adelaide as a capital city saw a huge amount of growth. Mm. Um, and then we've also got the property that he's owned in Huntfield Heights, where he's owned that for quite a while. Um, and that property is quite a large block. It has a substantial amount of land at the back of it. And, and I wanted to really focus on, on the low hanging fruit concept because Jack is a business owner and as business owners, we think we need to do major changes to, to get major benefits, but it's the little things that count. So a couple of the first things Jack and I discussed is around the business itself. Now, as business owners, we're so concentrated on reducing the amount of tax that we pay. Mm -hmm. But as a consequent or a consequence of trying to reduce the amount of tax that we pay, we may not work that little bit harder. We may spend a bit more money at the end of the financial year than what we need to. We may go out and buy more vehicles purely for a tax deduction. It all helps to reduce in tax, but it significantly impacts our ability to obtain more lending. So Jack and I discussed about some opportunities that are there with inside his business where he can improve his efficiency, improve his profitability, which will result in more tax that he needs to pay at 25 cents in the dollar in the profit, but it's going to amplify the level of borrowing capacity that he has. Now, to the misconception that's out there to a lot of people, very successful investors, majority of the time will have a very successful business or a very strong income they're earning from their salaries and wages. Mm -hmm. So Jack and I discussed what are some things that we can do to, you know, improve the profitability of the business. And it could be, you know, very short term um, increases in work. Jack, unfortunately, working a bit harder than he already is. I know he's working very hard as it, as it is already, but could be working that extra day. I know he's got a great tradesman and apprentice with him. Could be the opportunity of being able to try to bring on more work from more of the builders that he works with maybe bring in and hire in a couple more people if the work's there to be able to um, facilitate more 
profit. So that's a really good way. A couple of small hanging fruits that are there, Jack, that we discussed was increasing prices, obviously making sure that they maintained at a market value because if we increase our prices too much, no one will use us. Can, can I just so jump in a- very quickly, Jez? When you say about like working that little bit more, increasing the prices like for Jack to be able to increase that income, is, is there like a number, like a target figure that you've kind of got in mind for him? Is it about increasing it by 20 a year, 50 a year, 100 a year? What are you, what are you kind of looking at? So without going into detail with the numbers around too much, there's always, and the rule of thumb in business is there's always a 20% improvement that's staring us in the face. Okay. So a 20% improvement could be a 20% improvement and reduction in the cost that we pay. It's picking up the phone to your suppliers and asking for a better rate. It's a 20% improvement in maybe the expenses that we pay that we haven't looked at. So apathy, things like our insurances, the insurance bill comes in, we pay it each year. But when was the last time we actually really reviewed all of our insurances? And that could be for the car, could be for business insurance as well. So 20% is a bit of a bare minimum that all businesses can improve in most circumstances on a year on year basis. But then it's working with someone like Morgan and, and he'll go through this in detail in later stages, but it's working through what level of income are we requiring to need to be obtained Mm -hmm. to then achieve a level of borrowing that we're after. So then that becomes our bit of our goal. If Morgan says we need an extra 40, 50, $60,000 worth of profit to achieve more lending, Mm -hmm. well then let's have a look at our 20% improvement in cost cutting or 20% improvement of what we're paying or where we're paying. And then let's focus on the balance of being extra income that we need to earn. So it could be short-term sacrifices Jack, you need to make, which is working that little bit longer on a daily basis, um, but pumping out more work at a more improved amount of profit margin as well. How does that make you feel, Jack? I mean, it's fine. Short-term pain, long-term gain. It helps me get to my goal faster Then, yeah, definitely something I'm willing to do. Happy to jump on the tools for a little bit longer? Yeah, definitely. As we discussed, Jack, if the work's out there, you, you've got to find a way to eat it. Mm, um, yeah. There's always that old saying, how to eat an elephant and you eat it one bite at a time. Um, you don't try to overcomplicate it. You just got to get the work coming in and then you'll find a way, especially with you know your years in the industry, you'll find a way to make it happen. I know that finding good tradesmen and good apprentices is very tough these days, um, but they are out there. It's just a matter of making sure that you've got enough of the work coming in and opening the doors to maybe a number of other networks you haven't utilized in the past and bringing them into your business because it will result in more profit, yes, more tax, but there's the ability to obtain more lending, which will filter into more wealth over time that you'll get. So the improvement and the low hanging fruit I wanted to mention first was looking at our our situation around the business and finding 20% improvement in what we're currently doing as it stands at the moment, and then looking outside that to obtaining more work as well. Uh, A couple of the other things. Yeah, I was gonna say, what's number two on the list? Yeah, a couple of other things. So we, you know, you've got the Golden Bay property, the WA property, which has grown a little bit as well. Um, it's really researching and making sure that that's the right fit for your portfolio moving forward. Um, we know that a lot of the value on a brand new property is when it's that brand new, brand new shiny package, brand new toilet, bathroom, kitchen, all the other things. But it's just really looking at the area itself and having a look at how much more property is to come onto the market. So you still are in a position where there's high demand and low supply. A lot of people unfortunately wait too long to really review that and we start to see an inversion of that where we've got lots of supply and lower demand. Mm. So that's again a conversation you'll have with the property strategy side of things where Simon will come into that and talk to you a little bit more about that property as an asset long term and whether it's kept with inside your portfolio. Sorry to jump in there, Jez, you actually put this a really good way on, on your show on what school should have taught you. I remember you were chatting with someone, I watched the episode about um, would you buy the asset now it, as it's completed with what it's renting for right now because like when you've built it you're kind of a little bit more attached to it and you're like I've gone through this process I've done it all but it's like what it's cost me versus what it's worth the yield works but then your lens was more like don't worry about what it's cost you look at what it's worth and what it rents for would you choose that as an investment and if the answer is no that's probably leaning towards the considering selling path Absolutely. Absolutely. As long as the pivot is made into more investments. I think sometimes, Jack, you you don't strike me as a person that does this, but a lot of people, they get a couple of wins and they think they need to reward themselves a little bit early on in the journey. Um, And all of a sudden there's a brand new Dodge Ram parked in their driveway, which could have went to a cracker (laughs) property. So it's, it's making sure that, you know, you're still in that accumulation phase. Accumulation phase doesn't mean that I just need to continue to buy and hold everything. Accumulation phase could be a pivot 
sort of a rebalance of existing assets and improving them with better assets. Mm -hmm. And that's going to fit more in line with what you're aiming to achieve long term from your property goals. The other one was the Glenelg unit. I know a lot of the growth has come recently in the Adelaide uh, market, especially in that coastal environment south of Adelaide CBD itself. Uh, but again, a lot of that money's come in the last recent couple of years with the renovation that you've recently done. So you really need to look at that property overall long term, look at uh, what the market's going to be doing, speaking with a couple of good agents in that area. There still is a lot of demand. I know that there personally myself. Um, but it's ensuring that that type of property is it something that you've made your money, not from the rental income that it's achieving, but have you made your money already by putting that cosmetic reno that you've done many years ago? And obviously the growth's come in the organic way through the market and the increase of, of that particular area. So that's something I want you to really focus on as well. And the last one I wanted to really touch base on was the Huntfield Heights property. Now, um, I, I'll get you to share a bit more about it, Jack, but from what I know and what we've discussed is a large block, large block of land. If It's got a, a property on there, an older property, and you've had this for quite a while. But do you want to share with everyone just a little bit more specifics about the Huntfield property? Yeah, so it's a four bed, one bath on a flat block, 746 square metres. Updated kitchen, bathroom, probably about 15 years ago. Tidy home, nothing, nothing spectacular. Mm -hmm. Nice pergola and a, and a sort of big sort of grass area um, out the back. Has it been renovated yet? Doesn't need it. I, I've had it for two and a half years. Okay. So um, you'd see a decent amount of equity growth from then? Yeah, just through the market. Like it's done quite well right. in two and a half years. Yeah, it definitely doesn't need a renovation. Mm. But, but I mean, it, it wouldn't hurt. Like it could def could probably still add some value for sure. What's it renting for now? Uh, five fifty a week. Five fifty a week. Okay, so you on purchase is pretty good? On purchase, it was only renting for three sixty five. Because right. it, was it was currently tenanted when I bought it. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, you've had some really good rental growth. And then we jumped it up when we yeah got the, the chance. Okay, and, and what are you looking at this um, for, Jez? Because if it doesn't need to be renovated, I'm assuming you're not looking at an equity uplift here. It's already got some good cash flow. What, what are you thinking? Yeah, it's about squeezing every little bit of juice out of the orange. Now, typically speaking, on a very large block, as long as the dimensions are there, it's got good side access for potentially something to pop on the back. Again, with our low-hanging fruit fruit theme, mm. it's about what can we extract from this particular property, not just from a, a capital point of view, but from a cash flow point of view. Um, now, recently, we know that in South Australia, a lot of changes have been made to auxiliary dwellings there. Mm -hmm. um, although it's getting firmed up with, I'm sure, a lot of the, the councils and shires in that area, but the opportunity of having a large block and having grass that's generating no money to then having a dwelling on the back that's generating some money, sometimes is going to be probably again, low hanging fruit, our best and most efficient way to achieve cash flow. And if it can be, you know, a, a granny flat, 60 square meters that potentially can achieve 400, $450 a week rent, then if you're spending 180, 200 grand to achieve it, you're not really getting a better yield out in the market at 10%. And if you get the so, kind of grass that's going to get you a, a profit in um, in Humphrey Heights, you might get in a bit of, bit of trouble. That's a different kind of grass growing out of that. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's a really really good opportunity to improve the cash flow, which then improves the lending side of things as well. Got it. The other, the other alternative is depending again on dimensions and council requirements, if it has the opportunity of being subdivided and a property being built at the back, one needs to really look at the numbers. Mm. And Jack, this is something for you to really make sure that you're going with a town planner and maybe spending a little bit of money with an architect to see if it is feasible to do. But if you, know, you can build something at the back all in at 300 grand and achieve another 550, 600 bucks worth of rent for a three bedroom brand new property that's subdivided again the costs are there and it's feasible to do so then again there's no better property than your own backyard yeah so that could be a really good opportunity for you to improve cash flow improve your overall capital and equity position and that's going to give you a lot more opportunity to potentially move into other markets where my role comes in as an accountant is making sure that we're improving the position. So effectively making sure that depreciation is getting claimed along the way, what costs are claimable and what costs are capital. And then therefore making sure that the improvement in your back pocket, Jack, because that's all that matters at the end of the day is that whatever you're doing, there's an improvement to your bottom line. 
So that's where we get on board to, to make sure that these things are being effectively managed and efficiently managed. So there's some of the low hanging fruits, fruits as an accountant and as an investor that I see in Jack's portfolio. It's looking at the improvement of his business 20% reduction on costs and ideally the balance coming in from an improvement of top line, which will result in more profit, really looking at Golden Bay and understanding that market, the supply and demand pressures on there and seeing if there's a better pivot there that's available to you. Glenelg, where's that level of value come from and what level of values to come from that property long term? And most importantly, the Huntfield Heights property, it's really looking at what that backyard can offer you mm. from an auxiliary dwelling for an improvement of cash flow, maybe potential improvement of capital to a subdivision and a build, which is definitely going to improve the capital, definitely going to improve the cash flow. And, you know, with your skills as a tradesman, Jack, I'm sure you've got lots of friends. It could be something you can project manage as an owner builder, or it could be a couple of networks of builders that you've already got where you can get some prices fairly sharp. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit in your situation where you can improve your position on what you've currently got and that will lead to a better and improved position of what you will do moving forward in the future so your broker is going to love this particular conversation and the property strategist as well has got a lot of angles that they can look at to not only see what you've got but also what things you can get to make your situation always much more efficient along the way i love the granny idea or ssd depending on where you are in the country but you're generally looking at what like a hundred 150, 200 grand, uh, depending on size and again, which state you're in. But then if Jack, like you're saying, is leaning on skills that you've already got, connections you've already got, if you could get this done in the low 100s, potentially even under 100, depending on how big it is and how well it's kind of managed, that that yield would be off its head as, a, as an extra rental, which is going to like skyrocket serviceability for you. Absolutely. Spot on, Todd. Absolutely. A um, couple other things, Jack, I uh, wanted to touch base with you on. Again, we've had some really in-depth discussions around this, but the types of properties that you'll be looking to move forward to purchase, where I get uh, really involved is making sure that they're in the right structures. As it stands at the moment, you've already currently got three properties in the portfolio, which is really leaning towards then the, the next step is an investor in your journey which is getting some really good properties under the right structure and it's the type of properties that you're going to be buying so that's where again people like Simon and property strategists come in and my role will be to make sure that we're going to match the right type of property in the business plan of that property to the right structure so pending on those level of investments we will sway between whether it's your name or your partner's name Jack or whether we're going to go into a trust because ultimately if we can get the right type of assets in that right structure, people like Morgan will be able to really push forward with some really good lending strategies. Mm -hmm. And therefore you just need to make sure that you come up with the right level of deposits or have the right level of equity there that you can extract. And that's, that's going to be incumbent on that property purchase being at the right time. And I'm not going to put pressure on Simon, but inadvertently I am that right property <laughs> needs to be there for you to continue that level of growth and continue that level of cash flow, making sure that your journey has been, been well maintained um, with efficiency being the key word. I always want to have that in the back of our mind and anyone that's listening, what we're trying to do with Jack is maintain a level of efficiency so there's no leakage and we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel of all the assets, all the tax and all the properties and all the lending that he's doing so that it's, um, it's moving in the right direction because I think so many people say, I'll get to that later on or it's not a lot of money, I'll deal with it when I get to it. No, I think being a successful investor is plugging the gap straight away, mm -hmm. uh, which no pun, because I know you are a roofer, Jack. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if there's a bit of a hole there that needs to be plugged, we don't come back the next day. We, we kind of get the silicon on it that we need to or get the right screws there uh, because we all know a leak can cause a lot more damage than what it looks like on the surface. That's it. I know that we were talking about um, trusts and like corporate structures versus in your own name with Morgan. And he was basically saying that it's going to affect borrowing power a little bit. It's not, you can't borrow as much, but for a few different reasons. But what questions did you have, Jack, for Jeremy around that? Because you're at that stage now where it's probably time to start looking at it. Is there, is there a few questions you've got? Yeah. So just like, what's, what do you, what would you be leaning towards for what entity we buy in for the next one? Would it be our, so, our own name, the trust, or what do you think? 
Yeah, so it comes back down. I like to always really review the numbers of the property first, and it comes back down to the investment strategy the property strategist will put together for you. But I believe if it's a property that has a very strong path to being positive in the short to medium term, they're really good and ideal for trust structures. Two reasons. Number one, we've got the ability to distribute the profits when the profits are made. Um, and secondly, there could be some borrowing attributes and benefits attached to it where, you know, the broker can work with the banks to negate a lot of that debt as long as the structure and the trust is being done accordingly. So it, path to being positive and a big fan of really looking at the property with a longer term view. When we're buying an asset, Jack, we're not looking at just the next two or three or four years. We've got to say, well, our goal is to hold this 10 or 15 what's this property going to look like in 5, 10, 15 years? Mm. And if the property longer term in the 5, 10, 15 years is going to sway to being quite cash flow positive, well, then again, we all know property investing is a journey. It's a long-term journey. We don't make a decision based on a three or four-year outcome. We've got to look at the next 10 years, and that's where the right structure needs to be implemented earlier. But if the property that you are looking to buy is something you love and you might find yourself moving into it um, in the shorter to medium term or even even longer term, it's not something I really want to structure in a trust, Jack, okay. uh, because we're going to lose that capital gain tax exemption in the future when we do move into the property. So again, I think from your end, if you're looking at properties where there's a stronger path to being positive from the cash flow, from the rental income, ideally we want to keep that inside a trust. We forego a little bit of the short-term negative gearing benefits we lose for that long-term positive gearing benefits we have through the distribution, effectively managing the tax on the wealth or the income that's been created and also the borrowing benefits as well. If it's a property that's going to be quite negatively geared and we do need that level of tax benefit benefit, Jack, to hold the property longer term, and it really hasn't got a path to being positive from a cash flow perspective, ideally, we want to look at your name or your partner's name, but really focus potential on your partner. And the reason why I say yeah, that is, that? You, yeah, you being a director of a company, especially a roofing company, I see you know, you're, you're probably a higher risk as far as all the trades, because when something goes wrong in your industry, it's quite it's quite catastrophic. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't do things right or the flashing's not tied in or the gutters aren't being done to code, it becomes a very expensive job to fix um, or it becomes a very expensive exercise to remunerate the potential individual. So it's making sure we're managing that level of risk. We don't want to have too many assets in your own name because insurance will only go so far. And, and I've probably seen in your side of uh, or in your neck of the woods in the roofing space, Jack, I've probably seen more of those type of tradesmen businesses going to liquidate than any other um, only because okay. of the of the implications that are involved and yeah when mistakes happen mate they, they tend to be quite expensive um, and there's a lot of other products that need to be repaired and fixed off the back of it so I want to make sure that we're focusing on that and not putting your personal wealth at too much risk from any potential creditors or, or potential clients as well okay, so, okay. so asset protection side of things as well absolutely and we do get asset protection by putting and buying an investment you know in our spouse's name for argument's sake. So that's something I want to consider and really look into her personal circumstances to make sure that long term it's right. Um, and again, it's that negative gearing benefit that ultimately we need to get to maintain the property portfolio long term. And that's not going to come from putting properties safer inside trusts. I've got a question for you, Jed, but it looks like you did you want to ask a question first, Jack? The, the risk is sort of with the company. And it's sort of, you know, it's obviously a separate legal entity. Does that still put a the property at risk if it's on in my name absolutely yeah if okay. there's director guarantees that you've yeah. signed um for argument's sake you know you, you generally have quite a, a bit of supply um you know on account with maybe you know some roofing comp or roofing uh, producing companies or roofing supply businesses for argument's sake yeah um, and if something were to go wrong and it requires you to pay out a certain amount of money to a client or someone else, and it, it means you forego on the ability to pay your roofing supplies, then there generally is a guarantee involved when you sign up for an account. Yeah, makes And sense. that guarantee means that they come after you personally because it's a director's guarantee. Yeah. So okay. that, that's important, especially with any tax obligations you've got as well. In most circumstances, it is a director's guarantee involved as well. And again, it's not so much that might be the issue. It's another catalyst or another event which may cause you to have to lose a bit of money and therefore their roofing supply companies and the ATO now becomes a major creditor with a guarantee attached to it. Mm. 
So okay. it's a lot, lot of things to focus on in business. Yeah. We, we've got to focus on on external factors and and what happens if A happens, what what impacts B? And sometimes that's that connection we never make as business owners. A happens, what's impacting B now? My question was around if Morgan said beforehand that you've potentially got two purchases up your sleeve, I'm assuming we're going to talk to, to Simon about getting something with some decent yield, like s- standard Simon style smash and some uh, under market value purchases. But what you just brought up the other interesting low hanging fruit beforehand was like leaning on his trade skills, maybe potentially flipping properties. If, if Jack was to go down that path and he's potentially got two purchases up his sleeve, let's say one was an investment and then one was maybe something locally in Adelaide that he could actually uh, flip. What structure is he putting that in? Because I'm thinking company, but I, I want to hear your opinion on this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, Jack and I had a very interesting conversation on this. And I know it's something that you were leaning towards doing longer term. Um, but I think tradies just have such an untapped level of resources. Mm. And I feel that, you know, if I was a tradesman and I, I love being a weekend warrior and pretending to put my tool belt on, I've got all the tools and no idea how to use them. But <laughs> You know, if you have a nouse for being able to do a lot of little things, and it could be painting, it could be jib rocking, putting skirting boards in, you know, to use a nail gun, now to use a hammer properly with your left hand, not just your right hand. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you've got an opportunity of doing those things, I, I see a lot of successful tradies throughout their business career or out their personal income earning career flip properties and do really well out of it because they're really eliminating a huge portion of the cost, which is labor, because they're able to do a lot of it themselves, or they're able to call in a lot of favors, um, or have a lot of mates where they get the mates rates attached to it. So, you know, with Jack, you and I, we spoke about, especially looking locally in your own backyard in, in South Australia about what properties that you can identify there as an opportunity to make a bit of money. Mm. And if that opportunity can come from short term buy, renovate cosmetic, it doesn't need to be major structural changes like knocking it down and rebuilding or adding a fifth and sixth bedroom and turn into rooming houses. It doesn't even need to have the goal as it could be just as little bit of cosmetic renos inside a paint, the kitchen, a bathroom, maybe an update to the deck and just a clean up. Then, and sometimes you see at the moment, a lot of people are paying money for that mm. because the it, it's so hard to get reliable trades to come in and do the work and do it cheap or do it well. And if you can really eliminate that level of problem or and provide that level of service to the market, that's how you make money. It's eliminating problems and providing a service. Mm, absolutely. And that's where a lot of struggle that people have. They'd rather pay that little bit extra to get something they can move into without having to use their own cash, their own time, and potentially headaches that come with it to, to get it done on their own accord. So that is an opportunity, and that's where a company could be involved, Jack. My own roofing company or start something new? Start brand new. Yeah, Yeah. don't let it get attached to your roofing company. You want to keep this absolutely separate. And that's where utilizing your skills to buy property that you feel that has value that are run down in in some really good locations. You might get some really strong equity uplift, which gives you an opportunity to sell and only pay tax at 25%. We've got to weigh up whether there's GST involved in it based upon the level of services or the level of alterations you're doing to the property. But essentially, if you're paying tax or GST in any circumstance, ideally and hopefully you're making money and that cash then can be used to pivot into maybe some more buy and long-term hold property strategies but that's an option that's available for you and it could be as little as buying a property and renovating it yourself and maybe adding the auxiliary dwelling and holding it long term very mm. similar to what you have available to you at the Huntfield Heights property so mm. you have an untapped amount of resources available to you and don't think that you've got to do one or the other um, you know, Morgan suggesting that there's potentially one or two that's available to you. I think you've got both at your disposal and it doesn't necessarily need to be a house. I've seen a lot of people and you've seen that with your Glen Elg property from the renovation and the recent growth South Australia's had. I've seen a lot of people at the moment, Jack, turning to units. Mm -hmm. and renovating some really old 70s built units and especially that south of Adelaide and coastal market it's got a lot of those 70s and 80s built units Mm, crying out to be updated Um, and there's a population that's wanting it there's a population that's wanting that lifestyle of moving into a really renovated unit property especially with coastal aspect to it Um, it gives an opportunity to enjoy life not having to tiptoe around the leaking pipes or or the broken tiles so Mm. There is a genuine market available to you and with your skills as a tradie, I think it'd be crazy not to really look at it. Totally agree. How do do you feel about that, Jack? Definitely 
need to use the network I've around me of tradies, which I already did with the Glenelg property, mm-hmm. um, which worked quite well for me. You got that done cheap, um, man. Yeah, got <laughs> it done pretty cheap, like yeah. full full reno throughout, you know, floors, kitchen, bathroom, paint. Came up really well. So, yeah, I'd consider even another unit again. I'm a little bit bullish on the units in Adelaide, like the mm-hmm. price disparity now it's between a house big. and a unit is big. Yep. Whereas when I bought it, I could actually get a house in Huntfield Heights for probably the same price. Very much, especially if you're going to hold it for a little while as well. If, yeah. if that gap starts to close, then you're potentially going to enjoy some equity gains on two different fronts. Yeah. Yep. And a lot of a lot of people get petrified with tax, you know, especially you know turning properties into a business. Oh, Jeremy, I don't want to sell it because I want to pay the tax. But again, effectively being structured with inside a company it means the tax is only going to be twenty five cents in the dollar. Mm. So that's you know it's less tax than someone who's earning say fifty grand a year that's paying as a percentage of every dollar above that. So mm. you know the tax can be very easily mitigated. And the profit upside, again, utilizing your skills, there's, I believe if doing it well, there's a substantial amount of upside compared to the downside of the tax that needs to be paid, as long as you factor in the feasibility and make sure your transaction costs are all being maintained. But that's a really good way, especially if there's a longevity to that flipping business of adding that to your borrowing capacity as well. That flipping business, Um, you weren't saying that like Alf Stewart then, were you? That flipping no, business. No, 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 no expletives here, but if there's a flipping house business attached to it and you can show the banks, Jack, that there is a business, this is not just a one-off extraordinary item, not just a test and a test and trial type of scenario, but this is now a subsequent business that I want to go down the path of. And mm-hmm. you've got a history of being able to successfully, you know, renovate and sell properties in, in quite quick timeframes. And yeah, the banks will take that as a genuine, a genuine operation. And that gives you a, another opportunity to improve the borrowing capacity having that real cash cow come in not just from the roofing but now from flipping there's an ultimate level of benefit that's providing you being able to pivot into some really good long-term properties which have a sustainable cash flow to it good capital growth uplift as well and that may takes you well into your retirement Mm. but it's been consistent in the approach it's setting that business plan early and being consistent with your approach to do this and making sure that you're, you're spending, you know, your time for the due diligence. So I think you don't go into this with your eyes closed. You have your eyes very much open um, and, and hopefully working with some good people around you to expedite the process because you want to wait 10 years for this to happen. Um, you've got an opportunity, especially in your neck of the woods, to take advantage of a very strong market. So summarizing this, Jez, because I'm just very conscious of time at the moment, mate. So 20% is staring you at the face at all times, whether that's lowering costs by 20%, improving profits by 20%, but that's one of the low-hanging fruits Jack needs to have a look at. Looking at potentially selling off either Perth or Glenelg, potentially both, but really running through those scenarios, which is a bit of what we touched on beforehand with Morgan. Then finally, really, look, actually not finally, there's another one, and then looking at uh potentially adding an SSD or a granny flat to Huntfield Heights if it meets regulations, especially if this is an owner-builder situation that you can control to really keep costs down. That could absolutely slingshot uh, your serviceability into a whole other level. And then finally, making sure that if you do go down the flipping path, that you're going to be keeping that property in a corporate Uh, It's actually not a corporate trustee structure, just a company, because the intention is to treat it like a business, not as an investment. Is that a fair summation of everything so far, Jez? Absolutely. And the last thing we'll add is just the the future properties uh, that Jack buys. It's whether or not we work out it to be potentially in his partner's name or maybe his name Mm -hmm. um, or a trust with a corporate trustee involved, depending on that path to being positive. That opportunity that's there to see this property long term aid his borrowing and aid his capital growth and aid his journey. And that really is a basis and a a conversation that's done at the time of the acquisition of the property. Mm -hmm. So it could be, Jack, getting yourself deal ready for it. Um, but a lot of that conversation will come from, you know, the property strategist such as Simon, where he really will hopefully give you a really good path of the type of properties you need to acquire and how that's going to help all the other parts of your journey, the tax, the borrowing, and more importantly, your future, uh, which is what you want to achieve after all this is done. Jack, if you've got any last questions before we jump into that, is there any question, Jeremy, that you recommend we start off with asking Simon? I think the property strategy and the acquisition of the type of properties is, is important. So I think the big question is, what is the business plan for this property? Gotcha. And I think that's got to be in everything we do, whether it's business, whether it's working for an employee as an employee. Mm -hmm. Now, what's my business plan? Is it to become a partner over time? Is it become a co-owner? Is it to go out on my own? 
Um, so I really want you to nail down the business plan for the property that you're looking to acquire and making sure that it resonates with what you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, because what a be, what may be a business plan to you could be very different to the strategist and vice versa. So that that's probably one of the major themes I want you to make sure that you're covering. What is the business plan? Okay. Any final questions you got for, for Jez while he's on the line? Uh, no, that pretty much covered everything. Thanks so much for your time, Jeremy. Jeremy Unizelli, mate, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm sure this won't be the last time you see your smiling face, mate. Thank you so much for jumping on again, buddy. You're welcome, Jack, and looking forward to seeing uh, it all come together. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. So, Jack, biggest takeaway from Jeremy? Yeah, probably he's talking about the low using the low-hanging fruit. So what I've got is being able to use my business as a vehicle to really increase my borrowing power and, you know, really accelerate my ability to acquire more property quickly and also using my connections in the construction industry to to flip houses and renovate houses on the side for, to create more income. And that's something you're actually wanting to do as well. Like yeah. it's not just like, hey, here's this good idea and you're like, I don't, I don't like that. Yeah, it's definitely something I want to get into um, when I eventually get out of roofing, yeah, um, for sure. I'm, I'm, you know, I love property, especially in my local area. Like that, that'll really interest me. So how does that make you feel on the like increasing the income side of things with the business? Because I know you were saying a little bit before off air, you're like, if you're already approaching 30. It's like you can see that this is going to hurt your body a lot more if we do it for another 10 years. Are you looking at this like maybe this is an opportunity to go super hard and then go, okay, now I'm better off stepping back? Or like w- what comes to mind for you when you think like increasing the income in the business? Yeah, so probably finding a good balance of, uh, of both being on the tools a little bit and being off. Mm-hmm. Being off as much as possible. Trying to stay off the tools as much as possible and actually trying to work on the business rather than in it for sure. Yep. But if I can, you know, sacrifice the short term and get on the tools and really use my skills to my advantage mm-hmm. and really get that income up short term, then yeah, definitely willing to do that. Okay. So you're all in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Keen to go hard. Beautiful. And what did you think about the the granny flat idea? Because personally, I, I love that if it's doable. Yeah, for sure. Definitely worth uh, having a chat with the, the council. I think that's probably the a good way to start things off. Well, I mean, what's, because if you were to build a two better, because I'm pretty sure it's got to be under 60 square metres for the new regulations. So it's a pretty tight two better, but you could probably still make it a two better. But even as a one, I mean, you're going to be getting minimum $300 a week around there for, yeah. for rent. And if you can build that then for, let's say if you, if you really bootstrapped it and you used a lot of your connections when I built own a builder and it was around that hundred grand mark, what that's instantly like a 15% gross rental yield just mm-hmm. off the bat. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So I, I reckon that's 100% worth at least looking into. Now, co- company trust structure side of things, it sounds like a lot of what Jeremy was saying around that was it depends on the intent. If you're going down the flipping path, you're probably better off putting everything through a company. Uh, for As far as asset protection is concerned, maybe putting a property in Taylor's name is good to look into. But realistically, it's it's sounding like a corporate trustee structure is on the cards, but I didn't get the feeling that he was like 100%. There were still a few variables yeah. to that. Yeah, it sounds like either the trust or Taylor's name. Yeah. Yeah, I like the the asset protection for the trust sounds really good as well. And the, you know, the lending, uh, you know, down the track when it's, you know, looking after itself and it's positively geared, mm-hmm. um, you know, the bank's pretty much writing that off. Sounds really good. So, yeah. Absolutely. All right, man. Um, and questions to ask Simon before we jump into it. Anything coming to mind right now? or Where where should we be buying? Yep. What type of property? You know, what type of yield? As we've said before, like cash flow is going to be pretty important, mm-hmm. already pretty negative. So yeah, where are we going to find something that's, you know, reasonably good cash flow, but is going to grow as well, which is really what we're after. So what, where and yield? Yep. Done. Want to jump into it? Yeah, let's do it. Simon Liu, property investor and founder of House Finder. Simon Liu, how you going, man? Good. How are you? Very good. Got young Mr. Jack Noble with us. He's uh, been currently getting unstuck from Morgan Bushel and from a financial perspective on the lending side. Then from Jeremy and Azelli, we're talking about different structures, a few different things to approach from the business side. But now you're up when it comes to purchasing, what he's going to buy, where he's going to buy, what kind of yield. But I think there's a few other extra strategies you wanted to throw into the mix, man. So did you want to start with a question, Jack, or did you want to start, Simon? Who's um, who's up first? I spoke to Jack uh, a little bit prior to the call just to find out a little bit about 
uh, his situation and so on as well. You know, one of the things that Jack really wanted to achieve was to get to about 150K passive. And he wanted to do that uh, by the time he was 40, so in about 10 years or so. So, you know, maybe maybe it might be a good idea to break down really simply what that looks like. Uh, initially, $150,000 a year is a, is a, in my opinion, a pretty, a pretty realistic goal, especially over 10 years. Uh, it's something that, you know, for me personally, it took me about seven years to achieve uh, when I first started buying properties. And I was earning about 100K-ish, you know, in my day job uh, during that seven-year period. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, the houses I was buying was a lot cheaper, but even still, uh, I believe Jack is on a, a higher salary than that anyway. So, you know, giving a 10-year period over seven years, I think it's still definitely achievable. But 150 grand, this is how I broke it down, you know, in terms of how I kept track of during that seven-year period, right? So 150 grand is uh, is three grand a week. Let's say one investment property conservatively is going to get you about 500 bucks uh, a week income. That's a, a property that's fully paid off uh, after council rates, property management fees, insurances, and all the other holding costs. Mm -hmm. So to get to three grand a week, you're going to need about six houses fully paid off to achieve that goal. For me, the easiest way to get to, to, to six houses fully paid off, or the most riskless way, I should say, is to aim for at least 12 properties over time. And as you accumulate towards 12 properties, you'll have the option to sell some of the initial ones you bought that would have gone up in value. And ideally, every house you sell should theoretically offset or pay off another house that you have at the time. So ideally, you might buy 12 properties, you might sell down five or six of them during that time frame, and that'll be enough juice to pay, hopefully uh, offset another six or seven properties that you have. So, you know, if you give yourself 10 years to uh, to to buy 12 properties and you need to track consistently about 1.2 properties every year, obviously you can't buy 1.2 properties, but you're not buying 1.2 properties every year on the dot. Mm -hmm. right yeah. life doesn't work like that some years you might buy three or four some years you might buy one some years you might buy zero you know but as long as every now and then you kind of check yourself as to as to, okay cool i started this journey in 2024 you know it's 2028 now where am i at am i four properties or four -ish kind of properties down the down the line what do i have to do in the, in the next 12 months to to keep going to make sure i'm on track with that goal that's the sort of overarching way that you're going to get to your 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 goal in the next ten years. Does that make sense? Or yeah, sounds sounds good. It's pretty much the what I had in my head before actually mm. even coming in here. Like yeah. I, knew, I knew the strategy was probably going to be buy you know twelve, sell yeah. one half, and then keep the other half debt free. Yeah. If you have what it takes to get to twelve properties, I can almost guarantee you're not going to be stopping, and you're not going to be mm. selling either. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I know a lot of people, you know, clients and investors alike, where they have the option to get 100k passive, 200k passive in some cases, like if they had to consolidate their debt. But the knowledge you learn, the confidence you get, the the uh, the people you meet around you as part of that journey means yeah. you automatically become a lot more uh, ambitious. Yeah. And you might find yourself thinking about how to get to 200k or 500k passive, or maybe start your own business doing. X, Y, Z, or getting to development or whatever. But at least getting to that first milestone is, in my opinion, pretty important. At the moment where your uh, portfolio stands, you have a bit of a cash flow problem. Combined negative cash flow across uh, the two existing investment properties that you have is already $20,000 a year. Once you add in your owner-occupier repayments, uh, you're on about you're about $60,000 in the red. Yeah. So that that would be something that I would definitely address first. One of my suggestions would be to potentially sell Glenelg, you know, your two bedroom unit. Just to quickly jump in, Simon, why Glenelg? Why not um, Golden Bay? We'll talk about Golden Bay soon, but okay. uh, Glenelg, you bought that unit in in 2018 for two hundred and sixty six thousand dollars. Yep. Yep. It's currently worth around about five fifty. The property has more than doubled in value in the space of about six years. You did spend about thirty odd thousand dollars renovating it. It's actually costing you twelve thousand dollars a year to hold on to. And I know you've explored or are in the process of uh, of of going through Airbnb as well uh, yeah. to try and get more cash flow. Yeah. Well, but I think you mentioned that wasn't making too much of a difference. Is that correct? Yeah, or? it's pretty much um, after all expenses and stuff, it's performing pretty much the same as what it would on the normal rental market. So yeah. yeah. So my rule of thumb is when it comes to selling, you should always sell based on three reasons. The first reason is if you've made enough money on that property within a very short amount of time and the prospects of it making more money is unlikely. I'm not going to say not possible because it might keep going up. But if you've already doubled in value in six years, 
arguably you've experienced the lion's share of what that property can 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 do, right? It's done what it's going to do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Gotcha. So you should sell it. The second reason is if it becomes an opportunity cost, because you can take this $250,000 of, uh, of, of profit by selling Glenelg, and that can be used to buy another two properties. That's going to probably perform a lot better than what holding onto one two bedroom unit in Glenelg will, will do in the coming five to 10 years, especially since it's already, it's already doubled in the past five years alone, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's another reason you should sell. Another reason you should sell is if the house or the property is holding you back from buying more properties and holding you back could be in the form of you not being able to borrow more money because you've got your 12K per annum uh, in negative cash flow. But also you've still got a loan against it, I'm assuming, is that correct? Yeah, to, uh, 330,000. You know, that's borrowing power that can be going towards another house. So there's another opportunity cost. And then the last reason you should always sell is if a property is just costing you too much mentally or emotionally. So throughout your property journey, you're going to be buying properties and owning properties and they're all different. Some will perform very well. Some will just sit in the background and you're never going to have to think about it for 10 years. But then some properties are just inherently, you know, problem, problem childs. You know, it's, they might be, have consistent tenancy issues, maintenance issues. They might um, be very negative cash flow. It might be impacting your lifestyle or keeping you up at night, whatever the case may be. Sometimes it's worth letting go of those houses so that you can mentally move forward. Yeah. It's a really important point. I think a lot of people don't talk about this because, you know, in the world of property, we try to be unemotional. But the stuff that stops most people from, from progressing are these concerns, you know, these ongoing sort of, you know, keeping you up at night and all this kind of stuff, even though there's more opportunity and there's ways out of it because you're spending so much of your headspace just worrying and, and thinking about it, you, you kind of kind of talk yourself out of out of building your portfolio. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Morgan talked about selling, basically it was either Golden Bay or or selling Glenelg. Obviously that was yeah. going to improve things quite a lot. And, and yeah. asking beforehand why Glenelg, why not Golden Bay, from mm. before you even start talking about Golden Bay, what I'm kind of hearing already is because are you thinking that Perth has got a lot more potential room to move there with Golden Bay yeah. than, than the Glenelg unit? Well, the other problem with Glenelg is it, it is a unit. Mm -hmm. You know, units always, perf they never perform as good as houses. So if you can compare the performance of houses in Glenelg versus units mm -hmm. over the past six or so years, I know you've, you've made some growth in, in the unit but the percentage growth on the houses would be significantly higher. Um, it's just the demand for houses in Australia is always where people, 90% or like vast majority of people want to end up, yeah. right? And living in units and townhouses and villas even is considered a, a stepping stone to get yourself into a house ultimately. So I just don't think the unit market in Adelaide is, is going to be as in demand as Adelaide can potentially grow rather than houses. Yeah. And then the whole, you know, as, as, as with, as everyone knows, land goes up in value and buildings go down in value over time. So whatever properties you own in your investment portfolio should always have some portion of land component that you have. So that's another reason why I reckon, um, Glenelg should be, should be on the chopping block first. But the yeah. main reason is that you've simply made money on it. You yeah. know, you've made a lot of money on it. So sometimes, it's worth selling and just moving on, you know, moving that profit onto other properties. That's going to make you more money as well. How does that make you feel? The thought of selling Glenelg? It was my first one. So it's, um, you know, <laughs> bit of emotion. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to lie. Tiny yeah. bit. Yeah. But you know, not really. Um, not really. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> For me speaking from purely an emotional perspective, right? Like if you have emotional ties with the property, uh, then, then that you have to take that in, into consideration as well, definitely. Yeah, I don't really like it's if if, no. if I can sell this thing and get two potentially two <coughs> great properties that are going to perform well long term, then you're open to it. It's a no brainer. But I'll, I'll quickly have a chat about Golden Bay as well. Look, house and land package is something that I'm very very staunchly against. You signed up for this 12 months ago at around about the 480k mark and it's a two bedroom house in the rockingham region from my perspective that that was that was robbery you know you you yeah. you definitely overpaid there look it's not the fact that it's a two bedroom house two bedroom house a lot of listeners will be surprised to learn that two bedroom houses especially in in these sort of uh, ocean side suburbs in perth actually do exist and they're on tiny blocks as well typically 200 square meters or less i think your your one is about 200 square meters yeah, is that correct? 209. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
there's actually nothing wrong with the with the house being two bedrooms. I mean, obviously it's not ideal, but everything has a budget, right? Yeah. You know, the, 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 there's a certain demographic that will that can only afford it or may only need a two bedroom house. But you just quite simply overpaid because 12 months ago, you know, if I were to look at some of the deals we were buying in Perth, we were buying four bed, two bath, two garage houses, you know, in very, very similar suburbs, you know, and let's say we paid 480K at the time, those houses are currently worth 650 to 700K, you know, in terms of actual valuations uh, and also in terms of uh, where, how much people are paying for them nowadays. So imagine if you 12 months ago, you just bought like a normal house of 480K, you yeah. would have made all that money already. Yeah. Mm. You know, so that's it, it, basically that's a byproduct of getting, getting, um, of overpaying, yeah. you know, which is something that, that we never, uh, we, we, we never, we, we definitely always avoid. Yeah. Well, we've been talking about why you're stuck really from the perspective of your negative cash flow. And, and there's a few other things around the business that you can do to improve. But from what Simon's really highlighting here, one of the other reasons is because essentially there was maybe not the best choice made on the last asset selection. Because if it was more so like a house like Simon's talking about, then you'd be sitting here. Actually, you probably wouldn't be sitting here. You'd, yeah, but, but you'd be having another 200 grand potentially equity up your sleeve, plus probably a higher yield as well. So yeah. you're basically looking at this through the lens of, all right, you've made a mistake. Let's learn from it. Now, what kind mm. of an asset are you looking at moving forward? Are you, are you, is that a question for me? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Look, the assets we buy have always been consistent. I mean, we, I've been, I've been buying properties for myself for, uh, for, for 20 plus years. And I, I started this house fire thing about 10 years ago. The, the formula hasn't changed. Existing houses only. We do avoid renovations. We prefer to buy houses that are just clean, safe, and tidy, uh, rentable, clean, you know, just rent them out and move on. A bit of cosmetic wear and tear doesn't matter. A lot of people overthink uh, a little bit, some scratches on the walls and stains on the carpets and things like that. Don't worry about that too much. You maintain that condition until the day you sell it. That's when you want to do the big reno uh, to hopefully attract some very emotional buyers that'll pay too much for it. You know, houses only, major capital cities only, because that's where you get a consistent amount of population growth forever right a lot of people buying in these regional areas at the moment if you look at history they always do the same thing they go up a bit and then they just tank right because at the end of the day very few families are actually physically moving to regional uh pockets permanently right there might be some sort of mining project or something like that attracting a lot of temporary migration meaning people are just moving there to do fly and fly out kind of a bit of work for a couple of years and then as soon as it's over they, they move away so, you know, that means also the rental market in these regional areas are very, they're very volatile, you know, so all these investors, they pile in and then they can't, eventually they can't rent the houses out anymore. They can't sell them anymore if, if, uh, if whatever's happening in that regional area has finished. So it all comes crashing down. Whereas big cities, you get a consistent amount of population growth and that population growth drives housing growth at the end of the day, it's just supply and demand. So we need to pick the cities that are currently experiencing the highest amount of population growth. And currently it is Perth, uh, it is Brisbane. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and, and do a bit of a prediction here, but I think Adelaide is actually going to be next as well because there is the migration of the owner occupiers, median income owner occupiers moving around Australia at the moment. It started off in Sydney and Melbourne about 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. When they got priced out, they moved up to Brizzy. Mm-hmm. When they got they got a bit lofty, they moved out to Perth and Adelaide and so on, right? So let's use Perth as an example. As everyone knows, Perth has gone up quite a lot, but I think there's still a lot of room left to grow for two reasons. And I, and I mentioned this in the previous uh, podcast in a weekly slice that we did, Todd, but just quickly, quickly sort of summarizing it. Mm-hmm. Population growth is still extremely high. It's still super, super affordable. So for six, seven hundred grand, you can still buy, you know, a three, four bedroom house right near the beach and also right near the city. You know, it's a scarcity factor there. You can't achieve that combination anywhere else in Australia, let alone a big capital city. Whichever way you look at it, we're, we're four years into the boom cycle following 15 years of no growth. So I think there's, you know, for the next five to 10 years, we're not going to see a ridiculous double in value, you know, in two years like we saw. Because at any big city, whenever you go through that initial boom cycle, the first couple of years is always the most aggressive, right? And then once it gets to a certain point, it kind of, I wouldn't say slow down, but it just becomes more normal. You might get the standard sort of 5% 
every single year, that kind of a thing, five, 10%, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. So I reckon that's going to happen a lot as well. So Perth areas, up and coming areas, you know, we don't target the areas that are very well established already because in many ways you've already got a glass ceiling as to how much growth you can get. So I'll be targeting things like, you know, some of the outskirt areas on the north side and the south side of Perth. And, and Rockingham is a good example. I mean, Rockingham's grown up, grown a lot as well. You know, I, I actually think that there's going to be more room there as well. Uh, in, in a previous podcast I did as well, we talked a lot, a lot about Wadaroo, which is up north, mm -hmm. that sort of Queens Rock, Butler, Alcamos kind of area, plus a, a bunch of other suburbs. But those areas are the ones that young families, owner occupiers and first home buyers are starting to really filter in mm. en masse, right? And that is, for me, that's always something that I look for in any big city because you know not only a brand new demographic, you know, higher these people are going to be high in, high income earners, and that translates the city, the, the area, or gentrifies the area to become the new middle class or even the new blue chip area eventually. But as investors, you want to ride that social change as well, because it always exposes you to the highest amount of percentage growth over time. Right, so those are the kinds of pockets that we'll be buying in. Coincidentally, those are the areas that offer the highest amount of yields. Um, in a, in a big capital city. So a lot of these areas, we're still getting around about the, the, the sort of five to 6% rental yield mark off the bat, right? Which is decent in a major capital city and also mm. considering a house as well. But because these areas are also still significantly very high in rental demands, like vacancy rates are still less than 1%, in some cases less than half a percent, you'll find that the rental yield might become 7% plus within just 12 months of ownership. Mm. So literally one rental increase. Right. So usually when these sort of um, uh, sort of bread and butter areas, I guess you can call them affordable housing areas, they, they get to a certain point where the yield becomes two to three percent. That's when you know these areas have hit like a bit of a, a ceiling, you know, if that makes sense. So out of interest, the fact that you can still buy five or six percent rental yield type houses. Yeah. I think that, that's another sort of uh, sign that there's room left to grow. Is, is that why you're not a fan of um, Melbourne just yet or you don't think the timing's quite quite right? Because like if growth is really a, a big focus there, there's a lot of people talking Melbourne at the moment. It's at the start yeah. of it, but you, you don't yeah. agree? I don't agree. Melbourne's been growing basically since Sydney started growing, you know, around 2010, 2012, right? And I know Melbourne's done nothing for the past two years or so, but you can't ignore the fact that it's experienced about 10 years of constant growth. Mm -hmm. So you're still, in my opinion, buying at the at the very top of the price points, you know, for every single part of Melbourne. So whichever way you look at it, it's growth that you've already missed out on. So okay. that's the first thing. The second thing is the the problem at the moment in in the Melbourne market is all artificial. So like you know, it's all government, you know, putting in place the landlord policies and you know, the, land the, tax the, the silly land tax issues and things like that. Yep. And that's what's driving out a lot of uh, investors. Um, but also, there's, you know, combined with the COVID, I don't know if people remember this, but during COVID, there was, you know, there was a lot of, uh, let's say, backlash uh, with, uh, with the way the Victorian government handled, you know, the lockdowns and so yeah. on. And I think all these, this combo put together, uh, there's a, there's I've noticed a massive exodus of people wanting to live in Melbourne, just in general, mm. right? So I think that's it's going to take a, a lot longer for that sentiment to recover. And I've never seen a boom cycle last, let's say, ten years. You know, up until a couple of years ago when Melbourne started going stagnant, and then for it to suddenly pick up within just you know two or three years. Usually there's like a five or seven year lag period or, or a period where there's at least just um, flatlining, mm -hmm. you know, very little growth until it starts picking up again. So I fear the people that are jumping into Melbourne at the moment are in for a bit of a long wait in terms of capital growth. It reminds me a lot of the people that jumped into the Perth market uh, in 2013 2012 ish they basically had to wait 10 years of of no growth or maybe even negative growth and i know a lot of people did, couldn't wait that long you know they just got sick and tired of it especially when they started seeing uh, uh sydney and brisbane grow so quickly mm. they sold out prematurely and you know i'm sure a lot of people are kicking themselves out so you know you do have to time it to some degree and i think melbourne is just not not quite ripe as yet okay. so your view isn't that melbourne's so much bad it's just it's not the right time for it 
Correct, correct. Um, so right now, I think Perth is still is still uh, is still a pretty strong strong place to be in, um, and I think Adelaide as well. You know, I think for the for the sort of next in line uh, sort of group of migration that might be might be heading to towards Adelaide. So how does that feel then, Jack? So house Perth potentially Adelaide as well. Yeah, well, it's actually what I was thinking. Um, yeah. Melbourne, I thought sounds pretty good, but the the rental yields on top of what Simon just spoke about, they're a bit average. Yeah. It's probably not the right time. Um, but yeah. yeah, Perth and Adelaide, it's more than happy. Like that's what I had. Focus on getting a good deal. Like I can't stress that enough. Like you know, below, there are below still market value. Below market value. I know that term gets thrown around a lot, but the true test of a below market value property is if you can pull equity out within six months or around about the six month mark. Yeah. So if, if if you or if you or we go off and buy a house today for uh, six hundred odd thousand dollars, let's say, and then in six months' time you go back to the bank and you actually get to pull out a hundred k of tangible cash, that's a pretty good sign that we got a good deal. Mm, and that's yeah. how you can consistently keep moving forwards because after you sell Glenelg or even sell the house and land package that you bought, um, you're left with a, a chunk of cash but that might last you two or three properties. And then what? You still need to get to 12, right? Yeah. So eventually you do need to dip back into more equity with each house that you're buying to be able to buy more houses. And also it mitigates so much risk. Like I know clients that have bought properties and you know some of their personal circumstances have changed very quickly after buying the property and they have to sell it. You know, if you bought a genuine bargain, you shouldn't sell it. You shouldn't be selling at a loss. You know, let's not even talk about making money because when you buy a house, you got to pay stamp duty and legal costs. And selling a property, you got to pay costs and so on as well. But at least if you're not losing money, then you kind of feel okay, cool. There's only upside if I just have the ability to wait long enough. Do you mm, know what I mean? Yeah. So getting a good deal is very, very important. They exist. I guarantee you, they exist. We're seeing more of them actually in very hot markets because uh, uh, agents become super competitive in in trying to sell houses. Uh, so that you know they don't lose the listing and another agent gets them and and if you get if you can get in, to- in in contact with those kinds of deals you can get a real good you can get real good bargains as well all right so making sure jack's buying below market value like you're saying absolutely possible that there's one thing that i do want to actually quickly flag with you because i know we're about to run out of time soon mm-hmm. that jeremy was suggesting potentially looking into a granny flat maybe at the back of humphrey heights to boost mm-hmm. up some serviceability and cash flow for for jack mm-hmm. what are your thoughts yeah. on that Look, I would say do it as a needs must. You know, if if you're if you've completely run out of options, then then and that's your only way to go to progress. Then you know it would be something that I would explore. A couple of quick points about granny flats. I'm not actually a big fan of them, mm-hmm. and that's based on my own personal experience as well. Because I did one very early on in my in my investing journey, and it, it didn't it didn't turn out too well. You typically overcapitalize. Right. When you put one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars into a property uh, to build a granny flat, it's not going to be worth one hundred and fifty or two hundred grand more once it's completed. Mm-hmm. So that's one 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 negative. Another negative is an opportunity cost because the one hundred and fifty or two hundred grand that you spend on a granny flat could be, you might, if you can service it, if you can and borrow and so on, it should be better used towards buying another house. You're always going to make more money owning more houses rather yep. than the granny flat. Okay. Thirdly. Cash flow on paper doesn't always translate to reality because with granny flats, you get a lot more vacancies. Just the the nature of the setup of the granny flat, the two houses being so close to each other, and you've got two complete separate strangers living so close to each other as well. Mm-hmm. That can cause a lot of vacancies with the house in the front or the house in the back, right? Because eventually people are going to be sick of people walking down the side of their house to get to their own houses and all this kind of stuff. And then you also tend to attract perhaps some uh, a, a more of a lower socioeconomic type tenant as well. Yeah. And that could cause more vacancy issues and more tenancy issues. But also one other point to make is when you sell the house one day, or if you want to sell the house one day, you're more you're only mostly going to be appealing to other investors because people who are emotional about buying a dream home to live in. And those are the type of type of buyers that overpay or, or, or you want to sell your property to. Mm-hmm. Most of them don't want a house with no backyard and, and with a granny flat in place instead. So you're only going to get other investors who's going to analyze a deal based on the cash flow. And that puts a bit of a, a glass ceiling as to how much, uh, how much equity or sorry, how much you can sell the house for, you know, at the end of the day. So Got it. I think, I think it has a time and place, but maybe not, maybe try to avoid it as you grow. 
I know it might be difficult from a lending perspective, but all your capital and all your efforts should be focusing on buying more houses at the end of the day. So, that, yeah. That's kind of what I'm hearing is like, if, if it could be done in a way where it's like, okay, well this actually frees you up from a serviceability point of view, then it might yeah. be worth looking into. But otherwise, if you don't need it from that serviceability point of view, well then you're just yeah. tying up capital that could be used for a whole nother house. But like you actually made, made some very interesting points there about the actual tenancy side of things. It might not actually work out in real life the way that it does in paper. There's a bit more to consider than just like, great, another 354 50 bucks a week rent it's not worth it at the end of the day you yeah. know what i mean and then that that 300 400 a week rent is also uh, a lot more volatile as well mm -hmm. you know put it that way jack did you have any final questions for simon so if we're looking house perth adelaide um house and land package mistake sounds like it's time to correct that potentially get rid of glenelg yep. anything else you wanted to kind of run through with him mate yeah what sort of uh rental yield are we going to be looking at like to sort of keep the cash flow not positive yeah. but but you know a lot healthier than what I've got at the moment. For every consequent house, look, I mean, at the moment we're getting 5%, 6% uh, rental yields off the bat, right? Which is not enough to to keep it neutral cash flow even. But like I said, you know, it, it might be a bit of short-term pain because if you if you increase the rent with one rental increase to, and it gets up to 7% yield or more, then suddenly you're neutral or even positive cash flow. So when I talk about cash flow, I, I try not to encourage people to think about making an extra 50 bucks or 100 bucks a week in positive cash flow because that's not going to make you wealthy, yeah. right? Your ability to hold on to each house until they grow will. Yeah. So with the cash flow throughout the journey, it's it's a balancing act. You need to balance, you know, obviously buying in areas that are likely to grow, but also having enough cash flow so that you can keep your head above water when it can becomes to income versus expenses and also in terms of how much money you can borrow as well. So cash flow does change over time. Obviously, mm -hmm. everyone's anticipate, anticipating interest rates to come down in the coming 12 months as well. So that would definitely help. So in the first year, you might be negative five grand uh, that year, but in the next year, you might be positive five grand. Yeah. So overall, as long as it kind of balances out, that's that's the yeah. main thing. Five grand sounds pretty good. Like, well, yeah. That's what I'm kind of hearing. Then if you did actually end up selling uh, Glenelg and you're negative like 12-ish grand there and swapping that for negative five grand elsewhere, it's like you got a yeah. better chance of having some more growth. Mm. Plus, whilst your cash flow doesn't turn positive, it's certainly a lot mm. healthier. One thing I really want to quickly talk, uh, mention as well, I know we're running out of time, but with the house and land package, my advice is actually sell that one as well. I don't know, maybe if I didn't mention that as well in, when I talked about the house and land component. But I, I reckon once it's fully built, look, you, you thankfully Golden Bay has actually grown a lot in the past 12 months. So you've actually recovered from the fact that you overpaid 12 months ago. Yeah. I reckon if you were to sell it today, actually, I'm not going to quote just in case. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm proven wrong when you sell it. But you probably walk away at least breaking even after selling yeah. costs and so on. But the reason why I say you should sell it is you should sell it brand new. You know, you'll probably attract a a, 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 very, a small family or maybe like a downsizer, like a retired couple or something like that. Um, and you want to sell it brand new because that's when it's worth the most, yeah. right? So just get rid of that. Look at getting, getting rid of Glenelg. So you, you're kind of starting off on a clean slate and just buy these properties where you can, like I mentioned before, and, and just keep building the portfolio sustainably. Sell those two and just buy two? Or potentially look at buying three i would sort of reassess at that point you know yep. but look i always ad advocate for clients to just buy one at a time yeah even if you have the ability to buy five at once yeah just, right yeah especially when you first start mm -hmm. you know you, you, every property you buy especially if you're buying in perth or, or another state is going to be a learning curve as much as it is going to be a money-making exercise mm -hmm. so familiarize yourself with the with the with the buying process um, let the dust settle, you know, your team around you, property managers, tradies, solicitors, all those kinds of people as well. So as you progress and buy more properties in these areas, you can do so more confidently. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I, I dare say you wouldn't have any issues buying two or three properties off the bat immediately. And then six months after that may maybe reassess the first one, see if you can pull equity out on that one and then use that to buy the fourth, you know, so kind of keep recurring like that if that makes sense Mate, i feel like we've got the full set of plans selling glenelg selling golden bay buying a house mm. in perth gross rental yield six percent and by the sounds of it you could do that now even without selling those two from what you've chatted about with morgan so by selling both of those making sure that you're recovering any profit that you've got out of glenelg because like Simon's saying, that's potentially not going anywhere anytime soon. And then mm. making sure that you're either going neutral or possibly even walking, walking away with a little bit of profit from Golden Bay. And that's not only going to get you into another property, that's potentially going to slingshot you into another two, three and, and continuously grow. 
But like Simon's just saying there to wrap that up, don't just run into it and just buy like three or four straight away. Make sure that you're yeah. familiarizing yourself with the process moving forward and getting into the markets in a good way. But mate, I reckon this has been a massive help. Simon, is there any other final words of wisdom or anything you'd like to, to leave Jack with today, mate? You've got a pretty solid, uh, solid strategy there across uh, all three of us uh, to move forwards. Uh, I think it's going to uh, require quite a bit of commitment. So all the best there. And uh, I really look forward to seeing how uh, how it all unfolds. Simon Lou from House Finder, thank you so much for your time, man. No worries. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Simon. Appreciate it, mate. So, Jack, do you feel unstuck? Yeah, definitely. Even just with speaking with Morgan, like one thing I've learned is just to don't stop at one broker. If one says no, go go to at least one more. No doesn't always mean no. Sometimes it means I don't know. So ask yep. someone that does. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, just if, even if you have to go to four or five, like I've, I've found if, if someone says no, just, you know, go try another one. Keep asking them questions. What if I do this? What if mm -hmm. I pay down this loan? What if I get rid of this car loan? And just, yeah, find, find someone who's willing to work with you. So originally your broker's telling you basically you can't do anything now, but then the situation could change later with like return to work letters, uh, Golden Bay getting some rent. That's pretty much the situation or was? Yeah, that, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So absolute night and day. As far as like, like we said earlier on, you're pretty much unstuck just after meeting with Morgan. But then what's your biggest takeaway from meeting with Jeremy? Pretty much um, just really looking at the low hanging fruits as as he said, I'm a business owner, so I've, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to have a bit more control over what I can earn. Yeah, just really using that to my advantage and, and you know, really pushing in the next few years and earning as much as I possibly can to, to really boost that borrowing power and accumulate as many mm. properties as I can, as, as quickly as I can. I really like that whole, what was it? 20% is just staring you at the face. You, yeah. you just need to look for it. Yeah. Like, and, and it makes me think about like reducing costs by 20, 10 and like uh, increasing profit and uh, sorry, uh, increasing income by, by 10 and trying to give yourself that 20. Like if you can't actually just see an increase in 20% income, there's different ways that you can really even look at that and play with it. Yeah. Just have a look at where I can cut costs. Mm -hmm. You know, where can I push that a little bit harder? You know, spend that extra day on the tools during the week. Short-term pain, long-term gain, I suppose. All right. All right. And as far as uh, Simon's concerned, what was your biggest takeaway there? With Simon, um, I wasn't initially I wasn't expecting him to say sell anything, but seriously going to think about selling Glenelg. Mm -hmm. um, what, why Glenelg? Well, he believes that Golden Bay's probably got a bit better uh, prospects over the next few years. Glenelg being a unit as well, no backyard. Golden Bay's got at least a bit of land, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more. Yeah, being a house over a unit is probably the main thing. Um, and Glenelg's had a really good run. Like it's, it's done, it's kind of done its purpose. I can take, I can cash out now and get, you know, a much better asset. You've done well out of it. Yeah. It's, it's doubled or more than doubled really mm. So for a unit. It's pretty good. Is it going to continue to grow? That was a big thing I took from that chat with Simon. I mean, there was a lot of takeaways from everyone, but, but the whole, like, is it, is that $550,000 unit going to turn into a million dollar unit anytime soon? Like, I personally don't think so. And so if you're looking at that going, all right, you get loan of around the 300-ish the thousand mark. Uh, and I think we roughly worked out, you could probably walk away with like high ones after taxes potentially. Yeah. So then you're getting three, I think it was 330 borrowing power back and then almost 200 grand to, to play with capital wise. You're opening a few more doors. Yeah, definitely. It opens the door to getting something, you know, potentially even positively geared mm. and with some better... Uh, better growth prospects short term as well as well as long term mate so all up it looks like you've got some solid direction for your finance you've got a few things to think about as far as your business is concerned also structures taxation and what jeremy was saying as well about potentially going down that flipping route which i feel like could be a whole different episode in itself because yeah. that's a big one that could be unpacked but again something for you to, to consider and that's something that could continue to help you stay away from ever getting stuck again potentially if it's done right and then finally with with simon making sure that you're getting into houses more quality assets into areas that have got some solid potential for that growth but also that have some really good yield to them because whilst you're going to walk away with a bit of money if you did sell or even if you're just pulling out equity from golden bay like you said and i know this is it's not the nicest thing to hear but if you had bought a house for roughly the same amount of uh, money back then when you did purchase you'd potentially be sitting on a few hundred thousand dollars equity and there's yeah. two ways you can take that you can be annoyed at it or you can go okay cool well that's a lesson that i'm now going to take and move forward with which from yeah. all the chats you and i've had that's the one that you're picking that yeah that's it. it's a lesson learned be to cut my losses if i have to a little well i don't think i'll 
cut any losses. But all right, man. Is there anything that you wanted to kind of wrap things up with? Because I feel like we've we've got you from stuck to unstuck. Um, any kind of final words or questions you had? Uh, no, not really. I just want to give a massive thank you to Morgan, Jeremy, and Simon um, for helping me get unstuck, and also just yourself, Todd, as well. Amazing opportunity. Just want to really thank you for that. Thanks, so, man. Yeah, really appreciate it. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. And I've got to ask, uh, arguably the most important question, well, all of this wonderfulness aside, <laughs> and I've got to find out because you and I are about to go out for a pizza in a couple of hours. Jack Noble, what is your favourite pizza? So my favourite pizza at the moment is a, a Mexican with extra jalapenos. Mexican with extra? So you like it hot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. You getting this anywhere special or are you and Taylor making it at home? Yeah, no, I'm going to give my local pizza shop a shout out, Hilltop Pizza at O'Halloran Hill. I know that one. I've been there a few times. Yeah, yeah. they do make good pizzas. Good stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to Blue Velvet tonight, so I don't know if they've got Mexican, but they've got like six chair, uh, six cheese and pear. It's it's a bit French bougie, but um, we'll yeah. still be able to find something good for you. Yeah, no, that's sounding pretty good. Well, Jack Noble, thank you so much for jumping on the show, man. And if you guys are feeling stuck, you're thinking, actually, you know, I can relate a lot to Jack's situation. Or maybe your situation is different and you're wanting to get unstuck, sit in the chair across from me, have an absolute expert panel pull apart your situation to try and find where you're stuck and get you unstuck. Click the link in the show notes below and enter exactly the way that Jack did. Tell us a little bit about your situation and you and I could be going out for a pizza and getting you unstuck to continue investing in property. But, mate, thank you so much for jumping on the show. And um, hopefully I'll see you in another couple of years, but we'll be talking about your amazing portfolio. Yeah, sounds good, mate. Thanks again, Todd. Really appreciate it.